we've just uh, we've just been looking at a very elaborate description of the field work that Magnus Marsden did um, that formed the basis of his book um, Living Islam and we are going to come back to Southeast Asia now we are going to be considering uh, this book um, and it is on, it's called Humanizing the Sacred Sisters in Islam and the Struggle for Gender Justice in Malaysia and it's written by a um, Azza Basruddin and uh, what we're going to be doing is like other, um, other short lectures in the series I'm going to be taking you through and we'll be reading together and just reading over some of the details that the author of this ethnographic monograph, the details that she provides about how she did field work and the research methods she used and the problems that she had in uh, gaining access. So let's go into full screen now and we can begin uh, with this. And so on page 15 of this book, now remember the book is available for you. You can download it. We've made these uh, available. This research is situated at the nexus of gender, Islam and the state, specifically the Malaysian state. I bring together works on feminist studies and religion, transnational feminist studies and feminist anthropological theories. And she engages in a few uh, theoretical discussions. This book draws on these bodies of literature to examine how women's pursuit of fundamental rights within the vibrant Southeast Asian Muslim reformist traditions can contribute to broadening an understanding of the relationship of gender to the interconnection of Islam, state and politics. Much of the scholarship on Malay Muslim women is relegated to descriptive and explanatory frameworks generally focused on rural and peasant women, gender and development, family, kinship patterns and women and work. The scope of studies on Malay Muslim women has been enriched by notable studies linking economic dislocation and she goes on to cite the influential works that provide the context for her study, yet a gap remains generally about how elite Malay women work through an Islamic framework as a strategy to engage in um, the state to claim rights. My inquiry on the translation of feminist hermeneutical theories into strategic activism and po policy initiatives fills the ethnographic uh, la lacuna of Malay Muslim women uh, la live that intersection as s citizen believers. I heed anthropologists, so she cites, um, she cites uh, an anthropologist tradition of studying up by researching professional middle class and upper middle class Malay women and she places her um, her approach um, in what some people call shared ethnography of educated and professional women. And so she's placing this particular study in a wider context. She refers to the term elite as usually considered a term of reference rather than self-reference. Than the founding members, um, while the founding members cannot be considered the normative powerful elites who exercise hegemony to ma maintain control of their status and authority, they are elites in the sense that they have developed their own particular set of interests. In this ethnography, she explains, I hope to deepen our understand understanding about how Islam is intrinsic intrinsically connected to women's struggle for equality and justice. 
My methodology included participant observation, narrative analysis, informal interviews, collect, collective interviews and discussion. I also use archives such as newspaper reports, publications, by sisters of in Islam, pamphlets, email, correspondence, etc. These allowed me to ground my analysis within women's experience and live realities. She conducted direct observation and meetings, participated in the organisation activities and engaged in formal and informal discussions with organisational members. My role varied between that of a participant observer and a full observer as appropriate to each setting. I took part in Sisters in Islam study sessions, workshops and training sessions and acted as full observer in their public talks and annual retreat. I interviewed 37 Sisters in Islam members and 35 non-members. The non-member category was designed to obtain a wide range of perspective of how Sisters in Islam activism uh, circulates and incorporates individuals such as Islamic scholars, state religious officials, politicians, academics for example. I've taken careful consideration to circumvent theorising Islam as an ahistorical <coughs> and predestined factor. Quoting the scholar, Islam does not and cannot explain the condition of women, and each culture, gender and religion intersect differently. Women embrace, resist and subvert Islam and other institutions. So I approach the questions of Sunni Islam's authenticity uh, continually and legitimacy as lived by my interlocutors through and she quotes um, Tala Hassad's idea of discursive tradition. So she is interacting with theoretical issues when she is discussing her methodological um, issues. So memories of self and the field. My study is grounded in the tradition of feminist ethnography where reflexivity and accountability have taken centre stage to define ethnographic research as a collaborative intellectual and political practice. As a feminist researcher from the Global South in the Global North studying the Global South, I am mindful of how hierarchies of power and representation politics as well as my identity and, and, and positionality shape my methodological and epistemological approach. So, um, she quotes a scholar who suggested integrating speaking with and situated solidarities. Uh, these models generate knowledge across differences that do not reproduce interests of the privileged and are attentive to a material politics of social change. This model, she says, um, this model, which continuously calls into question the process of knowledge production in relation to the shifting local and global processes, is necessary if a researcher is committed to transformative possibilities. So her priority is to share the passion of these women activists in a, in a manner that captures their imagination and commitment, but does not freeze them on these pages. In doing so, she again uh, cites a scholar who talks about enactment of hybridity. So she enjoys interacting with other uh, scholars. Let's, uh, let's go on. Um, in May 2006, she explains, I left Los Angeles to begin fieldwork in KL. Since my official fieldwork was not scheduled until June, I decided to spend some time in Binang my hometown, so she is, a, a, she is a, a Malay. It has been more than a year and a half since I had seen my family and friends, and as the clouds parted on the plane, I prepared to ascend the city of my birth. Um, 
she mentions um, uh, what it uh, looked like came into view. I was flooded with excitement and trepidation and uncertain of how to negotiate these emotions. I was thrilled at the prospect of seeing people I knew, indulging in my mother's cooking and beginning field work, but apprehensive about a sense of unsettled settling emails, exchanges with friends and members on, on issues of professionalism, identity and representation. A particular exchange crystallised this delicate matter. A month prior to my arrival, my family took a five-hour trip from my hometown to Sisters of Islam office to procure first-hand information about the organisation. Upon arrival, my father introduced himself as the father of the UCLA researcher. He discovered that Sister of Islam was moving to a new location and inquired about the location, but a staff member had re was reluctant to disclose any information. The staff member informed me much later that she was suspicious of him because Sisters in Islam had encountered problems with detractors trying to infiltrate the organisation and vigilantes breaking into the office. At that point, they did not have any way of verifying who my father was. His protectiveness became um, material for good-natured teasing and joking during my time with Sisters in Islam, while the jokes were harmless and entertaining and even served as an icebreaker on many occasions. They left an imprint on my self-representation of how others perceive me. So this story serves to illustrate how the boundaries of personal and professional field and home are blurred, as well as the historically and culturally situated complex subjectivity, the multiple and fluid strands of identity that shape interactions with interlocutors. Researchers are never, never devoid of life's connections and responsibilities. As a Malay Muslim woman studying my own society, I can be classified as a native insider indigenous informant conducting research at home, but a feminist but as feminist scholars have aptly theorized, the distinction of native and non-native researchers is a problematic dichotomy that belies the shifting nature of identity, of identity and subjectivity, the transnational flow of people and ideas and the values placed on authenticity and erotic insider knowledge. It overlooks how a person can be simultaneously both an insider and outsider, particularly someone who migrated from the society into which they are born. Partic um, in my uh, only to return later to conduct research, my intersecting identities colour my research and motivate my passion for this work. As a Malay, as a Malay woman of Muslim heritage, I'm deeply invested in the Malay Muslims' movement for justice and equality. As a scholar, my intellectual inquiry and political project are based on understanding how these women activists claim their space, position of authority and leadership roles in Islam. As a Malaysian who has resided abroad for a long time, my experience has de detached me from the Malaysian community. In the early phase of my research, my interlocutors perceived me to be a higher social class and chose to communicate in English, even when I spoke Bahas Malaysia. They assumed I was an American citizen and inquired if I needed a visa to enter the country. My identity as a Malay and Malaysian was suspended in a migration and citizenship conundrum and replaced by an American identity and identification that was unfamiliar to me. This belonging or not within a community, culture and nation illustrate the unstable landscape of identity and how it shapes my relationship to people and place. 
I th and there's more material that we could uh, go through, but I think that what I would prefer to do is I would prefer, uh, so we go out of full screen now, what I would prefer to do is for us to, um, me to really encourage you to um, really encourage you to take the time to read uh, not only this section of this book, but also to go and make a habit whenever you see an ethnographic monograph, uh, to take the time to have a look and see um, how people explain their experience of field work, the access problems they had, how they negotiated being an outsider, how they um, conducted interviews about the mix of observation and interview, the languages that were used for example. So stay tuned, we've got some more books to consider.